a blue dance, a, a, a dark Cahill, a lead wing coachman, a quill Gordon, a Wickham fancy, a ginger quill, a partridge and orange, a green wool's glory, a Peter Ross, an Alexander, a water hen blower, one of my top fly pans, my own fly pan, a muddler daddy, absolutely deadly. That was Davey Watton showing out his top 20 wet flies of all time. I'm telling you here, this is this second one with Davey is even better than the first. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Let's take a quick uh, stop if you can. Press pause on this podcast and uh, and just copy that link and share it over with somebody else that might love a dose of some serious wet fly knowledge. This is uh, this is going to be a huge uh, for somebody that uh, wants to get going on this. This is going to be a huge one. So uh, let, let's do it, and then uh, and then we get back to uh, Davy Watton who's back today on the podcast to share his step-by-step process of fishing wet flies. Davey shares some tips on how to fish the fly with the tip and retrieve method. There's a a particular way he likes to do it. He talks about which rod is best and the two uh, fly lines you need when you're going out for wet flies. And he also shares the exact formula that he uses and the fly sequence um, that he uses. And that includes kind of you know the different soft tackles or wing wet flies. Lots of lots of good nerdy stuff. This is this is a fun one if you're ready to dig a little deep. So um, hang in there with me today, uh, and Davey will clarify it all for you today. Hey, before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal, uh, is our sponsor, and they're doing a great job over there. If you want to check out what they have going, head over to wetflyswing.com/ftj. And see what the new uh, the newest uh, edition is right now. So without further ado, let's just get started. Here's Davy Watton from DavyWattonFlyFishing.com. I'm happy to reintroduce Davy Watton, who's back on the podcast. How's it going, Davy? Oh, I'm doing great. I hope you're doing okay at your end of the world as well. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, we're all hanging in here. We're still in the COVID world, so that's uh, always keeping it interesting. But uh, yeah, how are things with you? That's true. I mean, no doubt, you know, this COVID business has, uh, oh, I don't know, it's made a lot of changes in the fly fishing world, that's for sure. You know, um, a lot of our fly fishing events are closed this year, and from what I see of it, most of the major events for next year also. So, you know, a lot of the major show events are not going to take place, and I guess it's something we're going to have to deal with all the time that this issue is still around us, you know? Yeah. Uh, Because stay safe, that's it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the crazy thing is that it's just yeah all the in person stuff is down and and so you're filling the gap probably you're still are you still guiding a lot? Yeah, uh, it's kind of quiet now. I think what happened this year, from what I've heard from most of my friends around the country that are guides, you know that there seemed to be a lot more fishing pressure. I guess somewhat related to the fact that people were not working or you know what I'm saying they got fed up being stuck in the house yeah. and. So, you know, that increased the amount of fishing pressure on a lot of waterways, and no doubt about that, which I guess is a good thing, but can also be somewhat detrimental to fisheries when they see that amount of pressure. But there you go. It's what it is. And yeah. There yeah. you go, I guess. I, I know. It's a, it is kind of a mess, and obviously there's... It's a crazy world, but hopefully we'll pull out of it here this next year and uh, be back in, uh, I guess, maybe in 2022. We'll see how it goes. I, I wanted to jump, you know, obviously we had you on, um, I'll put a link in the show notes to the episode. It was quite a while ago. I think it was episode 35, so it's been a few years. And we talked. That's probably uh, right. Yeah, yeah. And we talked. I listened to it again, and we covered a lot in that episode. I, I'm hoping today to go back into wet fly fishing, but maybe talk about the things we missed and dig into those a little deeper. So, Maybe just start us off with the wet fly fishing. Um, you know, I have some categories. I'm thinking of things to cover today, and, and we talked a little bit about. But if I, I look at, say, the rod, reel, line, leader setup, um, maybe some casting and retrieving, uh, some some techniques, flies. I mean, d- does are those topics, does that kind of cover everything, or is there anything else to add to that little list if we were making a list of things to cover? Pretty much, yeah. What you said there, 
it more or less goes across the board about what it's all around. I think um, for many people that are interested to get into wet fly fishing, I don't know, there's two ways to look at that, but um, there's a level of understanding about really what, by definition, we define in Europe as traditional wet fly fishing <clears throat> more than anything else, which, of course, is the use of multiple flies that are typically somewhat orientated to more wing wet flies, which are, we consider to be the more traditional values of traditional fly fishing, but also, of course, the, the uh, use of what is known as more the North Country style, which are more the soft tackle fly patterns and or the spider fly patterns. Although the orientation of wet flies across the board very considerably in the UK, whether it's England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and for that matter, other parts of Europe too, is not necessarily just confined to the UK waterway systems. So the evolution of those flies very much had a relationship to the geographical location of the waterways and uh, the fly tires in the area that developed fly patterns based somewhat, not always though, on the uh, insect species oh, yeah. that they were abundant with on those waterways. That's right. That's right. Okay. So yeah. So basically, depending on where you are, it's going to dictate what what materials, what flies you tie. So if you look at the U.S., just generally speaking, I mean, do you see wet fly fishing? Is it picking up some steam now? It seems like obviously you're you're a leader in this space, but are there others? Um, you know, fishing is it? Do you think it's getting becoming more common around the country? Yes, to some extent. If you if you look at the groups now on Facebook, you know, wet flies or you know, soft tackles, this that and the other. Yep. Yeah, there's no question of a doubt. There is a great greater material interest. Uh, in those flies, whether it's from the perspective of actually tying those fly patterns of origination, or as you well know today, <clears throat> people come up with all sorts of variables in their vice, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, also the uh, questions I frequently get asked via email or whatever related to, well, you know, how do I go about learning how to fish these flies and this, that, and the other, <clears throat> which is not necessarily an easy thing. We all know that if you set up with a fly or two or three or whatever, and you cast them across stream and you strip the flies back, sooner or later you're going to hook fish. And it's just one aspect of, of wet fly fishing in that respect. But there's a lot more to that, as you well know. And so we'll probably get to, yeah. to talk about yeah, yeah, that okay. as we go on. Well, I think we'll dig into, and there is a little bit of history there. I'll, I'll, again, I have a link. I think we talked about the, that in the last one, the different flies, but... Maybe we can just uh, start it off again for, to cover this thing in a step-by-step fashion. Just talk about first, you know, the gear. So, so let's let's talk okay. about rod, reel, line, leader, and uh, and talk about what what's the most common. If somebody's going to pick up a setup now, what do they need? And I mean, how does it differ whether you're fishing, you know, a big stream versus small stream? Is that a is that a big uh, factor? Yeah, to some extent. Uh, okay, one of the uh major things I get asked all the time is, you know, what is the best rod to use and, and this, that, and the other. Okay, well, let me just say this. Like any other aspect of fly fishing, if you was going to dry fly fish with, you know, small flies on 6X, whatever the case yeah. may be, you're probably not going to choose a seven-weight rod to do it, okay? And, and that's largely the case where traditional or wet fly fishing is concerned. You want a rod that has got a suitability to that style of fishing to present those flies in a manner that enable you to uh, animate those flies. And a stiff action rod generally does not allow that. Rod length is, an, is another issue. Obviously, if you're confined to fishing relatively small, narrow creeks or streams where you've got a lot of overhead structure, whatever it is, long rods may be a disadvantage to you. But that said, I, w- I will say this. There's no question of doubt whatsoever that a longer rod 10 foot, 10 foot, 6, and sometimes 11 foot, enable you to fish those flies in a more acceptable manner than a short rod, and and for lots of reasons. That said, the ideal rod needs to have an average line weight factor of somewhere between 3 to 5, and probably a 4 weight is overall probably best. Short rods have some advantage to a point, but they also have disadvantages also. For example, if you're using relatively long leader systems, which frequently we do, 12 to 16 foot, 
if you're using an eight foot or an eight foot six or even a nine foot rod to some extent, you're going to have problems when you're fishing long leader systems with mount, mount multiple fly systems set upon leader systems. You follow me? Yep. Yeah. So the ideal rod, in my opinion, for somebody that wants to get started, is a ten a ten foot rod around about a four weight with what we define as more of a mid flex action and a soft tip. Mm-hmm. Because that that soft tip, by virtue of the manner in which you animate flies with both control of your rod hand and your opposing hand, which is very integral so far as line control is concerned, will enable you to present flies delicately, whether they're upstream, across stream, or somewhat downstream. And by use of rod movement and left hand movement or line hand, you can animate those flies and make them look lifelike to the fish. That's which is very important. Yeah. Nice. Nice. No, I want to, and I want to dig into the line control here in a little bit. Um, and so the rod, yeah. so it sounds like, and I was just out Euro nymphing for, for my first time this weekend. And the rod I was oh, yeah. using was like a 10 and a half foot, I think three weight. And, um, would you say that that rod would work well for, for what we're talking about here? Yes, yeah. probably would for, for the majority of, of, uh, the, the, that style of fishing. Yes. The only time that you may find a rod like that is of a disadvantage is when we're fishing sinking line techniques with, say, intermediate lines, yeah. or in some cases, sink tips, because you just need a little bit more power in that rod to deal with sunken line techniques. But okay. so far as generally surface fishing, what you're using is probably suit perfectly for what you're doing. Okay, perfect. So let's, and I guess, can we stick with dry lines for a little bit? Is that a good uh, track to talk about and then and move into, or, or should we always be having some sort of intermediate with us when we go out fishing? Oh, yeah. The two most important lines are a dry line and an intermediate line for, for obvious reasons. If you have fish that are on or near the surface feeding, dry line. If you have fish that during certain times of the year are more inclined to come and take food sources on or near the surface or a midwater column, yes, a, a dry line. But there are times when, due to climatic conditions, water temperature, that are various other issues to fish are not inclined to do that. And so you need to get the flies at a lower depth to the face of the fish. And an intermediate line will enable you to do that. That said, you have more control, generally speaking, in the manner in which you present and control your flies with a dry line than you do, obviously, with a sinking line. Yeah, That's not to say that you can't fish uh, sinking line, intermediate line techniques and upstream modes or slightly across b- because you can. But ultimately, the dry line is the number one line. Yes. Yeah, okay. So so I guess just to simplify, and we'll talk about both, but we somebody should have both both lines. And is there a intermediate line maybe, maybe has a little more confusion on that? Can you just talk about briefly, is there a line company or type that somebody could look at? I'm not sure how common intermediate lines are nowadays. Okay, yeah, you know, most of the major line companies produce intermediate lines. That is a line that has a sink rate IPS of around one to two inches per second. And the the most common lines that are out there that do that are essentially what we call slime lines. It's a clear line. That's that's what they are. Um, Rio and a couple of other companies make a camo version of that. So it's not entirely clear all the way through like mono it's got you know step stages of like dark olive and brown and kind of breaking it up somewhat i don't know that it makes much difference personally i know a lot of guys that prefer to fish those when they're still water fishing but that's a little different to be honest about it but ultimately that's what you're looking for perfect perfect okay so we got that down so we we got the the rod the line and then the next thing i mean just take us to well, and I guess we can think of this as maybe the fish are, you know, you're using the dry line, so there's some fish coming up maybe on the surface. Um, what right. What's the leader look like? Let's talk about it because I know that's a big part of this. Break down the leader, just a typical leader somebody would, if they're going to build it right now, how, how would they build that leader? Okay. I, that's another good question. And the reason, let's just put it this way. I would tell you this, that it's not, it doesn't need to be a complicated issue of generally by definition, tapering down a leader. In wet fly fishing, we define the leader as the cast of flies in that sense of the word. So I make things very, very simple. And all I do is this. I have that a butt section to the end of the fly line 
which is built in segments of three foot, two foot, and one foot. And I use clear amnesia for that purpose. And to that, I add my leader, which is a continuous length of line of the same breaking mm-hmm. strength or, and or diameter. You can, by all means, if you choose to do it, use the butt section of a regular nine-foot tapered leader, okay? And then cut that down. So you're, you're essentially using a shorter butt section to it. You add your continuous length of line. Yep. Generally speaking, I'm going to use something in a ballpark of around a dry line surface fishing 5X or four pound breaking strain. So something in that region. If for sinking line techniques, I may add that or increase that breaking strain up to maybe six pound uh, for obvious reasons. You know, when you tend to fish flies at a lower depth, mm-hmm. particularly where browns are concerned, they can hit you pretty damn hard. And if you're not careful, you'll get bust off. But building the leader system should not really be a complicated affair, to be honest about it. It's, it's yeah. more or less just a, a short butt section off the fly line and a transition from it to your continuous length of the same diameter breaking strain line that the fly droppers are attached to. Gotcha. Gotcha. So just to clarify that, so so you have coming off your fly line, you have uh, a leader that uh, br- goes down in from thick to thin, and then off of that you have a, la- a length of line, which is your leader, your tippet. And how long is that section where you're tying your flies to? Okay. Well, let me get back up here. What I do from the end of the fly line, I run down from, from 20 pound of, this is clear amnesia, okay? So you're going to use about three feet of 20 pound, about two feet of 15 pound, and to that you're going to add around a foot, 18 inches of 10 to 12 pound. Clear amnesia. That, that essentially is your, your butt section. To it, you're going to add your continuous length of leader, which from the end of the 10 to 12 pound line, approximately 18 inches, maybe two feet to the first dropper. And then from it, at least minimum 25 inches to 30 inches. This is for dry line fishing, incidentally. Mm-hmm. At least 25 to 30 inches between the knots for the dropper spacings. Mm-hmm. And, they, and between, if you're fishing three flies, and some states you legally can't do that. I, I'm aware of that. But nevertheless, uh, between the droppers, you need exactly the same distance. So, so if you're fishing three flies, from your top dropper to your middle dropper to your tail fly, the distance should be equal. So it's 25 from the top, excuse me, the top dropper knot to the midsection knot to the tail knot. Equal. Gotcha. Okay? Um, if you're restricted to using two flies, then of course, you may shorten that somewhat because you're eliminating, to some extent, the top yeah. dropper. But the dropper length, based on the nature of the flies you're using, is an integral part in enabling you to present and, and fish those flies in the right way. But in, to simplify the matter, if you do basically what I've just said, which is three foot, two foot, mm-hmm. and one foot of 20 pound, 15 to 10 or 12 pound clear amnesia, or gotcha. if you choose to, right, and then add to that your uh, continuous length of uh, four pound line, at least for dry dry line fishing, eighteen inches minimum, maybe two foot to the first dropper knot, then minimum twenty five to thirty inches to the mid dropper fly, and the same again to the tail fly. Okay, that will give you pretty much a good standard setup for what we call a a, a, a cast of flies where you mount three flies. That's it. That's the cast of flies. Cool. And then and on your fly, let, let's just say you're using three flies, so you could tie one off to the, the main leader, and then when you go off of your, your other two would be off of droppers. Do you use like a surgeon's knot, or what, what are your knots you use there? Okay. Dropper legs. The top dropper, i.e., that is the fly closest to your fly line, should have a, a, a dropper length of at least, at least five to six inches. The lower ones, i.e. the mid dropper fly and or the tail fly or point fly, which is the end, of course that makes no difference, but the mid dropper fly, at least four inches to five. And our reasons for that is because in the process of animation and or retrieving or, or moving those flies through the surface film, 
that top drop of fly is used in a manner whereby just the fly works in and off the meniscus, i.e. the surface. And if you don't have the dropper length sufficiently long enough, you will cause the line above and or below that dropper to drag the surface. And that's not ideally what you want. What you want is that fly just to be visible in, visible to the fish in the surface, but not the line that's above or below it. Mm. Does, does that make sense mm-hmm. to you? Yep. yep. At least in that sense. If we're fishing dead drift modes, obviously where the flies are moving in a downstream direction in the surface film, it makes no difference. You still really want the dropper lengths of that length that I've just explained. The only difference is is that when you lift up to recast the flies, that you animate those flies into an off-the-surface film as you retrieve back before you pick up to recast and represent those flies again at any angle it doesn't really matter okay all right perfect and so that's good i think we got a good feel for the the you know the gear the 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 line leader and all that stuff i mean there might be more we can dig into but let's take it you know back to the river so are we fishing this if we're talking to dry line is this a situation where say you know a a hatch is occurring where maybe some sort of a dry fly would work like i don't know i mean you just you could say an atoms like a parachute or some color that matches the hatch but instead of using a dry line, we're putting on a wet fly, or is there more dependent on what's going on with the hatch? Okay, that's a good question. The thing about it is this. First and foremost, you, t- you, you have to take an observation. You know, what are these fish doing? Is there at any point of time during the time you are fishing the likelihood of a hatch, or is there one taking place? If so, what is the nature of the species? If there is none and there's no activity, then your approach would be a little different. Okay, so to put that into context, if you have a hatch, regardless of what it be, whether it be caddisflies, whether it be mayflies, you would generally choose flies that have some imitation or relationship to the species, Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Which makes sense, because that's what the fish are looking for. So, for example, you know, if the fish are taking caddis, then, you know, flies, they, they incorporate, for example, a wing wet hairs here, or even soft tackles, partridge and hairs. Those flies have a relationship, obviously, to, to what the fish are likely to see in, in that respect. If that is not the case, then you may fish flies that don't necessarily have an, a relationship of imitation to the natural species, but would attract them. So you may use traditional wing wet flies that don't necessarily, to our eyes, look like a relationship to the natural species, but there's absolutely something about them that creates an, an attraction to the fish. So, for example, flies like a silver invicta, for example. It, it's not necessarily a fly pattern that's directly tied to represent the species, but there's something about its value that attracts fish to it, even though there's no hatch going on, even though at times those flies will work remarkably well during hatches. So, my... The view about that is this. If I'm fishing, for example, a blue wind olive hatch, I'm going to use fly patterns, traditional wet flies, which may be wing wet flies and or soft tackle variations that have a relationship to that specific species. And there are a number of flies that would obviously uh, have choice at that point in time. If I'm searching water, what I mean by that is I'm looking for areas where I know fish should be, but there's no visible... uh, interest of the fish to feed on or near the surface because there is nothing there for them to do it. I'm going to use flies that will generally encourage fish to take them because they look like something that to them is edible. Yeah. Okay? And and that's where for many the, the, the confusion comes about I would say more than anything gotcha. because there are hundreds of different wet fly patterns and they say well you know well what do I use here what do I use there? Well a lot of that is experience, obviously, based on the fact that certain flies under certain prevailing conditions work better than others. And, for example, light conditions and time of the year are very much have an issue related to that. So, you know, obviously in the earlier part of the year we have cold water, fish are less sluggish or less likely to move around. Uh, food base is a little different to when the water conditions warm up and the fish become more active. Then we have conditions of diminished light where it's darker overhead days. And then we have days of lighter, brighter light conditions. 
And those, <coughs> excuse me, also would have an influence on the choice of flies you would use because it's based on visibility more than anything else to the fish's eyes and or color orientation of the flies that you use. I know it sounds a little confusing, but no, there is a basis of logic to it. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. And for over there, I mean, what's in your area? What is a common hatch, uh, you know, over there? What, what's, is there one popular dry fly hatch that you, you fish? Or that new on the White, on yeah, the on white the River here in Arkansas? Yeah. 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 Well, as you know, this is a, ma- a tailwater and subject to some massive generation levels. You know, it can be like 650 CFS and it can be as much as like 20,000 plus. Wow. And those water conditions of high water like that are generally not conducive to wet fly fishing, obviously, because it's just yep. so much volume, depth, and speed of water. But that said, to answer your question, the most prolific hatch we have here, unquestionably, are caddis. Unbelievable, amazing caddis hatches. So you have swarms, swarms of caddis in different sizes, micro caddis, larger caddis, and, and oh yeah, yeah. So yes. you have tons of caddis. So yes. when those caddis, I mean, I know caddis typically, I mean, they can just be out all the time. But um, I mean, do you find that there's times where you know, somebody might want to, I'm just thinking like the comparison between dry fly versus wet fly fishing, you know, is there a time where somebody might want to fish a dry fly if they wouldn't get them on wet flies? Or do you think you could pretty much use wet flies to catch them throughout the whole hatch? I, I can guarantee that. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I can. Yes. Because of experience, I know exactly what flies to use and how to present them during an emergence. Because gotcha. you've got to remember, <laughs> Give me that during the emergence, it's not necessarily the, the, the flies that emerged on the surface that are of interest to the fish. In a lot of cases, when there's a big hatch of, of caddis, surface flies are less important. It's, it's the emergence of the pupa from the caddis case up through the water column that's more important to the fish than flies on the surface, strangely right. enough. Yeah. And therefore, you, you would fish patterns that are somewhat more below the surface film in, in the water column. And you would fish them in such a manner is that you cause or impart those flies to re- represent to the fish how they would see the naturals, i.e. those fish that are ascending to the surface. And absolutely deadly if you do it right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah. l- let's dig into that now on – let's talk about that. So if you're trying to imitate some of those emerging caddis, and let's, let's say we're – would we still be sticking with uh, a dry line in this situation? And maybe you can talk about the different line control – and retrieves and some of the, how we kind of, you know, affect the flies to make them look like the bug. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, remember this, that in the stage of an emergence or a hatch, those insects, as they emerge, are are moving downstream. And as they're moving downstream, they're obviously coming off the bed of the river and they're ascending up to the surface on a downstream track. Okay. And so, you can represent your flies that you are fishing in the same manner. So, for example, you cast slightly upstream and or across, and as those flies start to sink, which they will to a certain extent, you raise the rod and you impart movement both with the rod hand and the left hand by different retrieves, which can be slow draws or what we call a figure of eight, which is punching the line in your hand. And you, as you do that, you raise the rod, you draw the line and you cause those flies to emerge up on the air to the surface as as you, as close as you can to how the fish would see the naturals. Now, you can also go further across stream. But generally speaking, remember this, that natural insects in the stages of emergence don't move upstream. That That's not to say that fish won't react to your flies being fished in that manner, but the more you can present the flies in a more natural manner to the fish, the more likely you are to get positive response. Let's just say that. So if you cast more across stream, and we're obviously here we're referring to, say, for example, caddis, and you allow your flies just to sink, which they will as they track downstream, even though you're fishing a dry line, then the same thing applies. You, you, you raise the rod very, very gently, And by recovery process of your left hand, which for most people would be their line hand, you draw those flies up to the surface. And and it it naturally will instigate fish to come up and take them. They they will, because they see the naturals doing the same thing. And so 
my uh, perception of that is is that you try to make those flies animate and move in a way that is indicative of how the fish see the naturals. Gotcha. If you fish the flies, okay. If you allow the flies to track too far downstream, then essentially what you're doing, as they call it, swinging wet flies. In other words, they track across toward you downstream and then they draw back. Yes, you will get response from the fish, no doubt, and you will catch some fish doing that. But you will also cause what we call chasers. In other words, a lot of fish will chase the flies and back off. They won't take them <clears throat> because they're moving too quick. Mm. And more to the point, if you're not real careful, you will, you will lose a lot of fish because angler instinct, as soon as they feel that tug, they instantly raise the rod and they pull the fly out of the fish's mouth. And it's kind of an art to that that you enable those flies when they're being fished more in a downstream track with what I define as more of a soft line approach. In other words, when the fish take the fly, you don't re instantly react by setting a hook on them or attempting to do that. You let the fish take the fly and you'll just feel that tension and that draw. And momentarily, you let that fish hang on that fly before you just raise the rod. It's not necessary to set a hook like you would if you were fishing a nymph under an indicator. Mm -hmm. The fish will basically hook themselves. If you react too quick, I will guarantee you, you will prick and lose a lot of fish. Yeah. And of course, once you've done that, they won't come back. But <clears throat> you'll also probably cause a lot of fish to reject those flies because consistently they see those flies moving across them at speed. They'll chase them. And they maybe do that once or twice, then they back off. They won't come back again. That's right. That's right. Okay, so and you're talking about no matter whether you're casting upstream or up and across, uh, the same thing you're talking about. If a fish hits, you don't have to necessarily, uh, you know, pull up on it like you would, say, if you're nip fishing or dry fly fishing. You kind of give it no, a second. I, I, no, I'll tell you this, Dave. Absolutely. One of the most important things about learning to be a, a very skilled wet fly fisher Fisher, is your ability to detect takes by visual indication. What I mean by that, and I know this to be a fact, that the majority of people that fly fish with wet flies and or soft, or, soft tackle, excuse me, <clears throat> are essentially casting more so across stream and they're <clears throat> reacting to feel as opposed to watching that line and or any surface indication that the fish has taken the fly. Which, if you if you focus sufficiently well enough, you will see that. You know, the line has to move before you feel it. You, you follow me? Yeah. And and, and often cases, uh, when you're fishing flies only near the surface, even though, <laughs> let me explain this to you, um, you may not see the line move, because at that point of time, the fish just took the fly, but it's not moved with it. Mm there will be some indication that a fish is did so because you'll see some surface disturbance or a break in the water or something will flatten. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you know the fish has got the fly in his mouth. Even though you never saw the line move or you felt a, a, a physical pull to the line. And, it, and again, it's focus and attention. All you've got to do is raise the rod. And I can assure you, as soon as the fish feels a bit of tension, he's going to react. He's going to swim away. And, and ultimately you end up getting hooked. Yeah. And so I see that all the time when I teach students that they rely on too much on feeling for the fish as opposed to watching for other indications that the fish has taken those flies, which generally speaking is by watching your line movement at the furthest visible point you can see it and or some surface disturbance, the fish has took the fly. Now, if you are using the droppers, or the top dropper fly, which is, of course, emerging from the surface of the water, and you're tripping that fly, is what we call top dropper fishing, you will visually see a fish come up and engulf that fly. And then once again, all you've got to do is essentially just hold the rod. You don't really have to set the hook hard. The fish will do it for you, because mm. they'll take, take that fly and in his natural reaction is to turn back down into the water with it. He's not going to carry on swimming out the water because he can, right? Mm -hmm. But he, he may take the fly below. So 
if you're watching that top dropper fly, even though a fish may not take it and it takes the fly below, you'll see some movement. You have to. Yeah. And once again, you react to that as opposed to feeling That's the cool. fish yank the fly. Right. That's cool. It's kind of like a kind of like a strike. I mean, it's almost like a strike indicator. You've got these flies on the water that are you could watch. Yeah, watch one of them or watch all of them. It's kind of, and I think if you get it back to Euro nymphing because Euro nymphing has this thing called a cider, which um, is mono, but it's like a strike indicator. I mean, would that if you had a cider on there, would that also um, because you, your whole leader's on the line or, or is on the water? Would something like that help some sort of a strike indicator, or is that your is is the fly your indicator? Okay, you, well, the two the two yeah. things there. The one the one is the relative distance from the end of your fly line to your drop top dropper, as we call it, is what we call our angle of hang. Okay, and so it is a little hard to explain it, but essentially what you're doing, you're holding the rod in such a position, and also by re- the manner in which you retrieve the line with your left hand. You're causing a belly of line from the rod tip to that top drop of fly. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and that, that creates an angle of hang. That's what we call that. And that should enable you to see visually what's going on. You, you're, you'll know whether or not a fish took your fly or not. Or you should. And describe that uh, again. So on the angle of hang, so you're depending on how high you're holding your rod, or when you hold your rod, are you always holding it at a certain angle, or are there many different angles you're going to hold your rod at as you're, as you're yeah. fishing? Okay. That's a good question also. Very rarely, if ever, your, your rod should point in the same direction as your fly line. In other words, the line should never be pointed directly off the rod tip to the flies for the simple reason You've got nothing to absorb the shock if fish grabs the fly. It busts you off. And the ideal angle of hang is somewhere around about 10 foot, excuse me, 10 o'clock, 10.30. Mm. That's the way to explain it. One. Yep. <clears throat> and that creates your angle of hang. And, and it's very important because it, 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 there's a lot of requirement with the use of both your right hand and your left hand to enable that to happen. So, to try and explain that one to you, and uh, it's something that takes a little bit of skill to get to learn. If you are retrieving, for example, the flies back towards you, it doesn't really matter whether you're doing it by very slow draws, whatever it is, 6 inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, and you're using a slow figure of 8 retrieve, bunching the line in your hand. The relationship between that and your rod hand has to be working together so as you're raising the rod you're also recovering line with your left hand it's not a question of just all of a sudden raising the rod and bringing the flies up to the surface gotcha you must use your left hand in conjunction with your right hand to make that happen and of course most times your um, left hand is controlling the fly line away from the rod. In other words, you don't have a fly line under your index finger like under the, the yeah. handle that you would if you were an infish and that kind of stuff. Nope. It's detached. Yep. And so <clears throat> so by using your left hand, if, for example, I've drawn my flies near or onto the surface and I want to extend the actual draw, in other words, the amount of movement that uh, those flies make across the surface, if, if I extend my line hand further away from my rod, in other words, I pull it away, what that does, of course, it draws the line back further away and also causes that fly to track further on or near the surface of the water for a longer period of time. But it is very hard to explain that, and it's something that you have to visually show somebody how they do it. And that, and that DVD of mine, Wet Fly Ways, did you teach you that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was just going to note that. I'm glad you said that. <clears throat> I'll put a link in the show notes um to that which i've watched um and it shows you just like on that figure eight you show you can watch your hands and it it looks kind of hard but just like anything i mean 
you know, we're, we're talking about things. A part of this is people need to go out there and experiment with their own river and figure out what retrieve. You know, it's just like lake fishing, right? There's certain different retrieves you do and you can't tell you exactly, yeah. you know what I mean, right? It, it depends on the situation. So I think this is going to give people a start and if, if they have questions, they could check back with you on things as they get into it. Um, but for the technique, it sounds like the angle of hang, the retrieve, depending on the retrieve, and the casting, whether up, up and across, those are kind of the main things with the technique. Are there is there anything else uh, just generally we're missing there that we would throw into the technique of wet fly fishing? Oh, yeah. There's a ton of that, to be yeah. honest about it. You know, you can have three flies, two flies, Obviously, obviously, bear this in mind. You know, if you're fishing a single fly, a single soft tackle fly, there's a limitation of what you can do with it. And it's, it's essentially, it relates to the fact that if you're fishing it dead drift, well, more in a mode of, uh, it's like a, a dry fly presentation, other than the fact that you don't see it on the surface because it's sunk below. If you're fishing two flies, <coughs> excuse me, or three flies, then you can create differences in the manner of how you present those flies because you can a animate two flies and or three flies but you can't really do the same kind of thing with a single fly because you don't have a detached dropper okay mm -hmm. right so now that said if you're fishing multiple flies two and or three the manner in which you retrieve those flies or, re or what we define more so as the, the, the means or method of recovery is very much an integral factor so far as whether or not fish will respond to it, which you, which may be strange for people to understand, but you may have the right flies, but you're not presenting them in the right manner to promote interest from the fish. In other words, you may be fishing them too slow, but you may be fishing them too fast. And you will find on any given day that the way that fish are more likely to respond has a relationship to how you present those flies, whether they're more in an upstream mode and across stream mode or slightly across and down, and how you retrieve and or recover those flies back to you. And, and you'll generally find on any given day, and I can't give you the explanation as to why, that there are certain means or methods of retrieve that the fish are more likely to respond to on that day than they do on another. And it's kind of weird how that happens, but it, it's, it, that's how it is. Yeah. And so that also has a relationship, to be honest about it, to, to the, the nature of the flies you're using. So, for example, if we're using, say, spider flies or very sparse soft hackles, you know, those flies are more conducive to being fished more in what we define more as a dead drift mode is supposed to be retrieved at some degree of speed. And when I say speed, I don't mean by the same method that you would strip a woolly bugger. That's a, that's a different thing. As opposed to flies that would be, say, wing variations. Okay? So you would fish those flies in a slightly different mode, generally speaking, with a little more pace to them. In other words, you move them a little quicker as opposed to soft, Fast spider, soft hackle fly patterns, which are more indicative of, of representations of insects that are in or near the surface film, whether they're emerging nymphs or drowned duns or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Okay. It, it, a lot of it's kind of hard to explain it. Yeah. No, I hear you. I, I, I think it makes sense. I think the... I mean, you're getting into some of the life cycle and entomology, which again is another another piece that people can dig in as deep as they want. It's interesting because I think I think I love that stuff, kind of the nerdy, the bugs, and understanding the life cycle. But basically, the wet flies, you know, in the simplest form, they're emerging from the bottom and swimming their way up to the surface because they want to hatch out and become adults. And you're just trying to imitate that that phase which is the wet fly you know it's just below the surface and so maybe give us one tip on, on i mean we've talked about some retrieves but you know how would you give us an example of maybe how you would imitate that caddis with a rod and your hand retrieve and, and what that bug is doing i mean is it is it like swimming upstream is it swimming up you know like can you give us a little bit of a snippet of what that fly looks like and and do you have is there any video out there of anybody that's ever taken that shows um did you ever get any of that in your wet fly ways that shows the bug are you referring to the naturals? 
Well, I, either one. I mean, I guess, yeah, if you had a, either the naturals or your fly. I'm just trying to get a piece for, like, what does that fly look like? What are we trying to imitate? You know what I mean? If we're talking caddis, what are we trying to make that thing do? Oh, okay. Well, it, okay. Really, what I'm doing is this. I'm using fly patterns that in my years of experience, of which is, like, close on 60 years of fly yep. fishing, wet fly styles, I'm using flies that, in my opinion, have a representation of how they see the natural insect, okay? Yep. And, and what I'm trying to do is impart mobility and or movement in the, with those flies that induce the fish to take them because they believe that the flies I am using are caricatures or imitations of the naturals. We, you know, the thing about it is this, Dave, is that I don't give a damn how good you are as a fly tie. You cannot create anatomically what a natural insect looks like. That's no. impossible. What you do is you correct a caricature of materials used in that fly that in some way or other, as a representation to the visual, to the fish's eyes, that it looks something related to the insect that it's looking for to eat. And as we all know, there are times... <coughs> when fish can become extremely selective, and largely that is due to the fact it's because they see the same thing over and over again, and they get tuned into how or at what point of time they want to take that natural insect. And that in itself has a relationship to, in the case of wet fly fishing, what you should also try to do with the flies you're using. So the context of that is that you use flies that have a relationship to, A, the natural insect, and B, that you present them in a manner that's conducive to how the fish generally see that natural insect. So, for example, if there was taking blue and olives, for example, you you would not be moving wet flies at speed because the fish don't see blue and olives move like that, or for that matter, any mayfly. What you're doing, or should be doing, is to be fishing flies that obviously have a relationship to the species in a manner, again, how the fish generally see them which is generally moving downstream toward them at a fairly slow pace or based on the, the natural speed of the river. That, that said, bear in mind that we have different types of wet flies that, as I've already discussed with you, that don't necessarily look like yeah. imitations of natural insects. That's right. and, and you fish those in a different mode. In other words, you, you trigger a response from the fish more than anything else. Yep. As opposed to, shall we say, the fish taking those the flies you're using because they look more like a natural insect. That's right. And so, um, the difference obviously is is this: is that you must visually understand the behavioural of fish, insofar as how they choose to see what they're eating. In other words, are they taking those flies as they're moving from the bed of the river to the surface? Are they taking them in midwater column or are they taking those flies, naturals, on or near the surface? And in consequence of it, your presentations of the flies that you choose to use should be ideally presented in the same manner to induce the fish to take them. That, that's the thing about it. And mm. the choice of flies that you use, again, is somewhat based on experience, but also should have a relationship to what it is the fish are eating at that time. Okay? Yep, yep. How would you know, you know, and that doesn't make a sense, you know, so bottom, mid, upper, if you're fishing it, you know, again, let's just say we're casting upstream or up and across with a dry line. Yeah. How do you know how yeah. deep how, how deep to get those flies? Like, you know, how, you do, know, you know, how do you know where they, is that just a life cycle thing where you understand the life cycle of the bug and, where it is with the hatch or, you know what I mean? Like, how, how do you know when to go deeper with a wet fly? Oh, okay. Well, that's largely based on the reaction of the fish. <clears throat> if I see fit, uh, let me give an example. And we already discussed this a little earlier yeah. on. If, for example, we have a big, massive hatch of caddis and we see very few fish, if any, on or near the surface, taking emerged caddis or adult caddis. What's that telling you? That, well, you know damn well those fish are eating those caddis at a certain yep. stage of their life cycle, which inevitably is always somewhere near or the closer, closer to the bed of the river. Because what they're doing, they're concentrating on the emerging pupa, 
as they're coming out the caddis cases, or if they're not that particular species, whatever, they're taking them somewhere near the bed of the river. And the reason being, it's easier for them to do that. They don't have to expend so much energy up or near the surface. They can sit there close to the bed of the river, <coughs> excuse me, and eat those uh, bugs as they're in their stages of transition of emergence before they get to the surface. In such circumstances, it may be necessary to go to an intermediate line to get your flies deeper in that water column. And that is somewhat based, obviously, on the speed and depth of water you're fishing. I, I know from experience, Dave, that if I'm fishing water that's, uh, say, four feet or less, and it's a fairly medium flow, you know, it's not running real, real fast, I can pretty much do anything I want with a dry line. Let's put it like that. because. If you cast a sufficient distance further upstream, as the as those flies move downstream, they will sink. You know that's just they 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 do, and they get down to quite a considerable depth if you if you allow those flies to do that. If you cast across stream, well, obviously downstream movement of surface water, which of course is interrupted by the drag of your fly line, if you don't control it won't allow those flies to get down to any acceptable depth. So in order for them to get down to depth, you have to control your fly line with what we call slack line mends that don't interrupt the sinking rate of those flies. So they get down to a certain depth. And so the relative angle that you cast out, if you're looking directly upstream at 12 o'clock, then you go around the clock, like one o'clock, two yep. o'clock, three o'clock. Okay, so if you cast as flies more at a relative angle of, say, 1 to 2 o'clock, and you don't create tension to the flies, you'd be surprised how deep those flies will get down. Hmm. What, what, what you then do is when you believe those flies are at a, a relative depth, which is inducive to those fish seeing them and taking them, then you, you incorporate rod and left-hand movement to draw those flies up on the earth to the surface. And as they rise up through the water column, the fish see them in a manner which they would see a natural, and you'll get a very positive response if you do it right. They'll, gotcha. they'll hit the hell out. They gotcha. really will. That makes sense. And, and, the, and the thing about a lot of wet fly fishing techniques, regardless of whether you're using wing wet flies, whether you're using soft tackles and spiders, is that the relationship of the flies you use has to have or should have a relationship in the manner in which you present them and fish them. And I think, as we already talked about, obviously, if you're fishing flies that are imitations or representations, shall we say, yeah. of natural insects, then you fish them more so in a manner appropriate to how the fish see the naturals. If there's no evidence of emergence or hatches or whatever on that day, even though there's the precedence of that species at the time around, that doesn't mean to say the fish won't respond to uh, the manner in which you fish the flies that are essentially being fished in a manner imitative of the naturals, even though they're not present, present at the time. The fish are used to seeing them, and so they should still react to your flies that way. So, um, yep. and that's kind of something also you bear in mind. You know, even though there's no hatch today, it doesn't mean to say the fish won't react to the flies fished in a manner which is related to those insects because they hatched yesterday or the day before the day before. You, you follow me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's, there's, there's quite a bit going on in that, um, you know, and obviously we, we, we can't dig into everything here. So it all, uh, oh, like, no. like I said, I'll put a couple of no, uh, links to your, uh, resource. And do do you also, is there some stuff online? I don't know. Do you have any, uh, like YouTube videos or anything else that people can go take a look at if they want to look right now? At kind of some of the stuff we're talking about. Yeah, there's, there's some segment. Yes, if they go on, yes, if they go fly fish TV on YouTube, there are some segments on there taken from some of the uh, DVD as that I've did in the past. Um, you know, I was going to mention too, also, Dave, that um, you know, there's quite a good interest anymore, as we already talked about on Facebook with different groups. Yeah, and you know, they have, have more interest in uh, wet fly fishing and or soft tackles and spiders, that they can go and join those groups. And, you know, and there's fairly good discussions. I don't necessarily agree all with it, I might add, but yeah. there's some fairly good discussions on there, the natures of flies and people tying different fly patterns and methods of fishing, this, that, and the other. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I will say this, you know, that certainly there's a lot more interest in uh, fishing wet flies, so to speak, than there was, you know, some years ago. Uh, I would only add to that that in many cases, I think people that choose to pursue it, they really don't uh, get into the higher levels of skill. Let, let's just yeah. say that. You know, they're more inclined just to fish across and down. In other words, swinging yeah. wet flies, swinging wet flies. You know, and that's only probably 30% of the relative skills in understanding the skills of wet fly fishing. There, there's much more to that. You know, upstream dead drift techniques, or slightly across dead stream movement techniques, this, that, and the other. It is no just one way to do it. Yeah, what are the, let's just quickly go through, because we talked about it a little bit, but the, the upstream, maybe talk about the different um, casts. So you got upstream dead drift, you got slightly yeah. across, uh, slightly across and down, and then are there any other ones that you would add to that list? Yes. You, the, okay. Any method of presentation is, and what you do as far as the uh, movement and or control of those flies once again, is based on the nature of the flies you're fishing. In other words, whether they be soft tackle spiders, wing wet flies, just whatever the case may be. And so, I, the more you eliminate fly line off the surface of the water, that's the first thing, the better. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, consequently, a longer rod enables that to take place. You know, there are times I use, obviously, 11-foot rods. Uh, not all the time, but... You, you have to remember this in any aspect of fly fishing anyway. The fly line can be your enemy because if fish see the fly line first and it creates uh, somewhat, shall we say, a disturbance or an awareness on the surface of the water, they're less likely to take your flies. That's a given. And so the longer the leader systems you use or you're capable of using, the more you eliminate that. More to the point, when you're fishing... Uh, more upstream and or across techniques with uh, wet flies, no matter whether the wing wet flies, spiders, soft tackles, or whatever, the further you can keep those flies away from the visibility of a fly line, the better. And more to the point, the flies will fish more naturally. In other words, yep. if if you were to try to fish, for example, I'm, I'm just saying it in this manner, a dry fly on a six-foot, leader you're not going to get really much control so far as natural drift no. but if you extend that by another six foot so you fish a 12 foot leader or even longer you understand yep. you, you're more likely to get a natural drift because there's less influence of surface movement on that leader than there is on the fly line you've just got, got to control that drift and that's largely true with wet flies so if I'm fishing more in upstream modes, I tend to like longer leader systems, at least 12 feet, if not more, at times. But that requires some ele- elementary skills of casting because the one thing about wet fly fishing when you're fishing multiple flies is if you don't develop a good level of casting skill, you're going to get tangled up one hell of a lot. Yeah. And, and, and that's largely due to the fact that in most cases, the anglers are overpowering the cast. Once again, you know, a longer rod with a mid-flex soft tip action enables you, and you should, cast a much slower casting stroke. And that will open up a wider loop from the rod tip, obviously, to the flies that in, should lessen the amount of tangles and or tailing loops if you do it right. And I think for many people it becomes very frustrating for them that they keep getting tangled. They keep getting tangled. Yeah. Well, there's obviously two reasons for that. One is the casting skill. <clears throat> and the second one is they haven't built the leader system correctly. In other words, it, it, it's too close it, or too long. Yeah. It's all both. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's exactly right. That's a, that's and so my advice to anyone is that the longer the leader system overall that you can use, comfortably the better it is particularly when you're fishing dry line techniques the further you can keep that fly line away from your flies the better because it's less likely to spook the fish you want the fish to see your flies without any other thing distracting them and a fly line will do that 
if you enable that fly line to visually be seen before your flies. That's now, the other thing about upstream fishing, if I might add, yeah. is that when you're fishing, and it doesn't really matter whether it's two or three flies, is that you never allow those flies to track by definition in a straight line. Uh, what I mean by that is if you make a direct upstream cast, let's say at 12 o'clock, as you would maybe a single dry fly, well, those flies are going to track back towards you in a straight line. You, you follow what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Yeah. And so what, and that is not what you want. You want those flies, and if, assuming we're casting upstream and the river's to our right, you want those flies to track so that they're separated. In other words, one fly is going to be a lot further out than the middle fly to the top fly. In other words, they're coming down at different distances apart. They're not coming down in a straight line towards you. And so that keeps the separation of the flies spaced apart as they track downstream. And so that also gives a better visual to the fish. If you keep flies too close together, in other words, what I mean by that, they track down in a straight line. Yeah. It, it, it can be, it disorientate fish. They don't know which one to take. Right. You need that separation between the flies. And an uh, interesting thing about that is that, and again, it's something I can't always give you the answer to it, but you may fly find that it's either the tail fly they want to take all the time or the mid fly they want to take all the time or the top dropper fly they want to take all the time. It, it is very strange how that occurrence takes place, but for some reason or other, the odds are the fish are able to see all of those flies, but there's, there's one of those flies that they particularly want to hit, more so than the other two, if you're fishing three. And that's largely also the case when you're fishing two. <coughs> it may be the tail fly they like to take, as opposed to the mid-dropper fly. My point about it is that you should always present the flies in a manner where the fish have a definitive choice between those flies. In other words, they don't necessarily need to see them at the same time, if that makes sense to you. That does. So I'm just thinking, again, going back to, you know, the casting. So you've got a section of water you're covering. If if there were fish all over the place, you know, you might cast directly upstream or at a slight angle to cover the water. Then you might cast a little bit more, more out to cover that water. Then maybe even cast a little bit more out and down to cover so you're i mean you're just trying to cover all the water if you have a little spot that maybe there's one spot you know it's it's the fish only holding a little four foot section you might only have okay. to make one cast right to cover that water yeah that okay that uh, you that's a good point you just raised that that is a real common fault that the angler approaches the water there's fish rising all over the place yeah and they immediately start casting chucking out the fly line and fishing the water What I mean by that is they assume by covering the water that sooner or later they'll catch some fish. And they may well do that, but that is not an appropriate approach. You should always adopt the the approach of fishing for the fish that are visual to you that are closer to you first. Don't just all of a sudden start chucking everything out (laughs) across stream because you see 50 fish. Because the odds are, once again, as I just made reference to, that if you start lining those fish, you'll put them down. Yeah. And and the further you, you do that, then the fish move further and further away from you, and all of a sudden, you yeah. completely shut, shut them down. And yeah. I think, like, you know, I taught on the Midge um, Magic DVD oh, yeah. that I did, work for the fish that are closer to you first. Don't yep. put down fish between you and those ones that are the opposite side of the river. Work those fish first. And also, I would tell you this, that if you have a good emergence and or surface activity of fish, fish more in an upstream to an across mode, not across and down. Because once again, if you do that, you're going to line fish and you're going to skate flies through where those fish are visually seen feeding You'll get chasers, you'll get prick fish, and ultimately you will end up putting them down. Work more in an upstream mode. In other words, say from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, in that angle. What yeah. I call fan tail. Yep. You, you, you see? Yep. Mm. That makes sense. Those things are so important. Okay. Okay. So, mm-hmm. um, 
So I want to touch on a couple of things before we get out of here. Uh, one of them, we yeah. talked a little bit about this, but you know, reading water. Let's just briefly talk. So you got, um, you know, you got riffles, pools, glides. Oh, yeah. You got all this different stuff. Yeah, Where, yeah. you know, again, if we're talking caddis, you know, are we fishing? How do we know when, when do we fish six inches of water and when do we fish a pool? Oh, okay. You know, again, that is a good question. The fish will tell you that. Yeah. You know, typically, typically, natural insects when they emerge, they're going to be forced by seams and currents to concentrate in certain zones, you know, like in current seams and this, that, and the other. Mm. And and the consequence of that is that the fish themselves know that. And so, if you have, say, for a fast water riffle coming off of the top of a shoal, the odds are that, you know, there's going to be natural food sources concentrated in that area. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the consequences are so are the fish. And so it makes sense to fish your flies appropriately in those kind of zones. That's not always the case, mind you. You may well find that the fish choose not to be in those faster water riffles. They may be off to the side in the slower seams, particularly where mayflies are concerned. Not so much caddis, but particularly mayflies and stuff like that. And small small insects, you know, like small coronamids, whatever, yeah. small baiters. This, uh, big, and, the, and the reason being, they visually see them better. And it's also easier for them to eat them. Let's put it like that. And so reading water once is important. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, and certain times of the year, obviously would have a relevance to that. You know, early part of the year when the water is cold, that's one thing. Uh, also, as we get into the summer months, the water temperature increases. Then trout typically look for water that's got more movement and more oxygen to it. And so just just little things like that tell you from experience more more so where you're likely to find those fish. And the consequence of it is is that you would present your flies more so in those zones. Let's put it to you like that. Yeah. And of course, this time of year, as we have now, temperatures are dropping. We don't really have much in the way of surface activity. Um, like here, we've got maybe blue winged olive hatches and coronamids. That's that's pretty much it. So the fish are generally going to be a little more deeper in the water column, on or near the bed of the river, because there isn't too much up there to get them interested in the surface anyway. And they're generally going to be more in the slower water seams as opposed mm. to the faster water seams. And that's where you should concentrate fishing your flies. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, again, another another variable, but but yeah, time of year and water temperature, and yeah, you wouldn't expect as much activity in in the winter time as you would. So maybe fish the the, the slower water, the deeper water, you know, whatever, more pooly as opposed to like a six inch. Ripple. Yeah, it's the the things that largely have that relevance. I, I tell you, Dave, are, are water temperature and, and, and percent oxygen related issues. You know, DO levels in the water. Let's yeah. put it like that. And 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 that's largely where fish find their comfort zones more than anything else. And so, and also bear in mind water temperature as a relationship to their their feeding behavior. You know, very cold water, they're less likely to want to eat too much. And as water temperatures increase in the 45, 50, 55, 60 degrees, yeah, they get more active. And so do the food bases that they feed on, which is also a relative uh, factor, you know, that water temperature has a relationship to food, emergence right. of hatches, this kind of stuff. That's see? right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's take it out here with the flies. You know, obviously, this is a big uh, piece. I think when we <laughs> talked a few years ago, I think we talked about, I think I said, well, oh, I'll get you back on and we'll talk more about flies. But again, we're, we're leaving it till the end. But let, let's... um. You know, wing flies, wing wet flies, soft tackles. Can you break down, just talk about just generally, what what are the general types of patterns? Are those the three, the soft tackles, the wing wet flies, and then the attractors? Is that the three wet flies? Okay. I, I kind of look at it like this. We have, um, in this sense of the word, uh, flies that are more of an imitative nature. For example, like a March brown wing wet fly, yep. a uh, wing wet hairs here, or uh, an Adams or an older or something like that. Those flies have more of a relationship to, shall we say, imitations of naturals like blue winged olive. Then we have flies which we would consider to be more of attractors, you know, and some of the uh, the listeners here probably would not be f- too familiar with them, but we have flies like a Peter Ross, a Dunkeld, Wickham's Fancy. You know, they're typically flies that have got silver or gold bodies to them. Uh, there's just something about the, the attractiveness of those flies. 
under prevailing conditions to fish reactive. They, they do. Um, uh, Alexander is absolutely one of my favorite flies, a silver body fly with peacock sword wing. And uh, it, why they, they hit that as good as they do, I don't know. I think that in all probability as a representation of maybe a little small pin fry or something like that. And so we have, you know, flies like lead wing coachmans or Cahills, this, that, and the other. There are flies that also have got some relationship to natural insects, but that's not always the case as to why the fish take them. You you could go to a river system and you could fish flies that you know, in all probability, no one else has ever presented those flies to those fish. Okay? and they But you catch them. And why? Because the fish have just got a natural curiosity about something they've probably never seen before, and they're going to react to it. The difference is, of course, it, for us as an angler, when they take it, we know they've done it, and we hook them. Else, otherwise, they would spit the fly out. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> you have flies that I would categorize as imitators, i.e. they are flies that are, like we just discussed here, like March Brown, this, that, and the other. Then we have flies that are attractors and that fish take for curiosity, I guess, more yeah. than anything. The the interesting thing is historically, if you go back hundreds of years in the UK, where, of course, all of this really has its uh, history and evolution, is that the, in many cases, there were big differences between the flies that were innovated more so for river and stream fishing as opposed to those which were used and are, and still are for lake fishing or lock fishing. Mm-hmm. But the the interesting thing about that is also that there's differences in the manner in which those flies are, are fished or presented to the fish. You know, trout in a natural lock, wild trout are a little different from fish in a stream or a river system. So there's differences in the types of flies that were used and or the manner in which those flies were well presented but you know let me just say this if the truth of the matter be known within 20 fly patterns and i'm telling you this from my world yeah. experience of fishing all over the world you can guarantee pretty much within 20 fly patterns if not less that there's not a water in the world that one or more of those flies will not catch fish i eat it, it, it that's it there. that's it so, yeah. hey, Davey, maybe maybe we can do this to take us out. Could you give me those top 20 flies, and we'll call this Davey's top 20 or something close to it, 10 or 20 top flies, wet flies? Oh, yeah, I can, I can yeah. Um, some of these some of these would be wing wet flies, and some of them would be um, yeah, throw, spiders or snuff tables. Throw, throw them all okay. together and say this is if I was to put a, I was to create a PDF, which is just like Davey's top, top wet flies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you'll have, uh, hmm, okay. March brown, for example, you can have a uh, <clears throat> a wing version of that or a, a soft tackle version of a March brown. The same thing would be for a hare's ear. You can have a wing wet hare's ear or, a, like, for example, a yep. partridge and hare's ear or a grouse and hare's ear yep. or a grouse and green. You know, they're all similarly related flies that you would use. A older fly, for example, <clears throat> a black gnat, yep. a blue dun, a, a, a dark cahill, a lead wing coachman, um, Oh yeah, a light K hill, a March. I oh, know. Sorry, I already said that yep. March Brown. Uh, PMDs, yeah. Yep. A Quill Gordon, a uh, Wickham Fancy, a Ginger Quill, um, a Partridge and Orange, a Greenwall's Glory, a Peter Ross, an Alexander, a Water Hen Blower. Yeah, all of those. Well, all right, let's have it. That's One, that. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 13, 14, 15, 16. That's either, I think that's 16, 17. Do you have a, a, a few more to, to add to give to guess to 20, or is that good? Oh, yeah. Some of, yeah, definitely. One of my top fly pans, my own fly pan, a muddler daddy, absolutely deadly. Okay. Okay. Uh, a uh, a Dunkeld. What, how do you spell that? Oh, D U N K E L D. Okay, Dunkeld. Okay, it, it's Dunkeld. an attractive. It, it's an attractive fly more okay. than anything else. Okay, uh, um, I think we're close. Maybe uh, one or two more. Yeah, a uh, 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 Watson's fancy. Okay. Um, 
That should be good. That and should be good. It. If we, if I, if I'm not quite there, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a message again, another, another flyaway. But this will be good. I think this is going to be, this is going to be Davy Watton's top, top twenty at all. I don't know if they, they're probably not in that order, but just those flies. So if somebody had those twenty flies, they could probably um, cover the world with wet flies. Oh yeah. If you take, for example, a PMD, okay, a pale, morning a pale morning dawn, yeah, yeah, you can have that fly in variations. You can either have it as a spider pattern, you can have it as more of a heavier dress soft apple fly, and or you can have it as a wing version. So once again, like if you go back to say the March Brown or the Hairs here, we can have variables in the variations of that fly. In a wing version, a, a fairly ha- heavily uh, dressed uh, soft apple version, or a very sparse fly, to, uh, excuse me, spider fly version of that fly. Yeah. The only difference is the variables and how it's tied, but it's essentially the same fly. So it's a wing march brown, a soft tackle march brown, or a spider fly march brown. Do you follow me? Yeah. yeah. What, what's the, the the soft tackle march brown versus the spider? What, what's the difference between those two? Oh, uh, very, very easy. Uh, because the difference between the spider version and more of a, although they're essentially both soft tackles, don't get me wrong, because yeah. they're essentially using a soft tackle. The difference is the body variations. Mm. So, for example, for the spider fly pattern, we may have a very, very sparse dub body of hairs here with, say, possibly a, a yellow thread rib or even a gold rib, and a very sparse turn of hackle, maybe one, one and a half turns of hackle only. Okay? Gotcha. And if we're going to have more of a heavier version, we may add a tail to that. We may have a heavier body. We may add something a little different in the thoracic region. So we have, like, say, for example, a hair's ear for the body, and we may put a a peacock hole for the thoracic region, and we may have a heavy hackle. So we may use, for example, dark brown red grouse hackle as opposed to, say, brown partridge hackle. So you create a heavier version of the fly, which may be more suitable for heavier water conditions as opposed to what I would define as slower movement water. In other words, slower mo- moving water in, uh, say, shallow, faster riffles, I may choose to want to use more of the spider version as opposed to the heavier hackle version, which I may choose to use more in an intermediate line as opposed to a dry line. Yeah. Okay? It, I, I know it's kind of confusing, but... There is, there's a basis of, of sense as to why you do that. Yeah, no, it, it makes it makes sense, and I guess just clarifying, I'm probably not totally on this, but again, you know, depending on your depth, the water velocity, all the other different variables, you might use a spider, the more of the sparser one in those areas that are a little more, say, the shallower water or something where it's a little more skimpy, yeah. where the soft hat or something a little more heavier thoracic section you might use in some deeper, heavier type of water. Yeah, but not to confuse the issue further. If we use those three flies as an example, we could fish up a, fl- a three-fly rig. All right. We would put, we could put, say, the spider pattern on the tail, okay, the heavier version of the soft tackle on the mid dropper, and the wing version on the top dropper, okay. And so, would those flies work in that combination? For example, during a caddy search, yeah, I guarantee you they would, hmm. if you present them right. And, and similarly, you could do the same thing, for example, if we're fishing uh, PMDs or blue wing dollars. We could use a very sparse hackled fly on the tail, and we could, in increments, build that up. So we use more of a, a heavier hackled fly in the midsection on the mid-dropper, and we use a wing fly on the top dropper. Because yeah. if, you, if you look at that, 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 that transitional factor of emergence of the natural insects, when the nymph is first ascending to the surface, it, it's, you know, pretty small. <clears throat> As it emerges near to the surface, of course, its transition is going to change before it gets into the winged insect, okay, which is the dung in the case of BMDs and or uh, blue winged olives. So you're kind of, in some respect, trying to represent with the flies you're using the transitional stages of the emergence of that insect. And, and, and in cases of those flies, obviously, you're going to fish some more in dead drift modes. And once again, I have to go back to say that the manner in which you present those flies, in, and what I mean by that is the relative angle. Right? You know, you're casting more upstream, slightly across, and you're allowing those, allowing those flies to dead drift mode 
So you bear this in mind, that that very fast tide um, spider fly pattern is going to sink quicker than the mid dropper fly or the top dropper fly. And the reason being, obviously, is there's less material on there to to, to create resistance. So it sinks quicker. The more material you put on the fly, the slower it will generally sink. Let's just say that. That's right. And what's the and just to, to finish this up on the winged, so is the wing you're going to use more towards the like more closer to the surface emerger? Is that what the wing wing is for? Yes, yes, yes. Because yes, that's right. Okay. In in the circumstances I've just given you, yeah. it's because you're using the fly that is more representative of the transitional emergence of the nymph into yeah. the winged insect. It's awesome. Yes, that's it's right. Awesome. Yeah. No, this makes total sense. I think. I think we laid out a perfect uh, system and, and even got your uh, your top 20 flies. So, uh, Davey, I guess there's – I'm just trying to look, make sure I haven't really been looking at my notes, but I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. We had a couple of questions, um, one from Jonathan Stalker. He was asking about um, – favorite well we talked about the flies but favorite knots um and so is the knot uh is the sur- what is the knot is it the surgeon's knot you're using to make your leader oh yeah yeah okay that, that's a good point you asked me that question let me just say this that years ago historically gut of course was what was used to build these leader systems and and historically what would happen was that the fly fisherman would go to the fly shop and he would buy a cast of flies. And those flies would be readily tied and attached to a, a built leader system. And there would generally be three, sometimes four flies. And those flies would be patterns that would be orientated toward the time of the year. For example, if you are going to fish at a time of the year when the caddis was the predominant species, the odds are when you bought your cast of flies, it would incorporate fly patterns that were related to the caddis. Okay. And once again, I have to say that was back in the times when anglers uh, bought their, their flies already attached to what oh, we right. know as yeah. the flies. Yeah. However, now, a lot of the, the knots that were used mm-hmm. back then were necessary because of the way gut was as a material. You had to use specific knots. Today... A lot of those knots that we used back then are absolutely unnecessary because modern filaments, whether they be nylon, copolymers, fluorocarbons, da, 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 it doesn't make no difference. <clears throat> you don't need that. And I, I will tell you from experience, I've probably tried every knot you can even consider or think of that is known to produce droppers. And I will tell you from experience that absolutely the best knot to use is a surgeon's knot. It's known as a water turn knot in the UK, but okay. a three a three turn surgeon's knot. Yep. You cannot over or beat that. It's very simple. Yep. It's not complicated. These people that want to screw around making like detached droppers with loops on and put the loop on it, forget all that nonsense. I don't use I don't use tippet rings. Nothing like that. You you complicate the issue by creating more knots than necessary. That's you know, right. there's like some it. of them that argue. Yeah, you know, they argue, you know, where you bust the fly off and your drop it gets short, this, that, and the other. It's no big deal. All no. you've got to do is just, just attach in that section of line. And so you cannot beat a three turn surgeon's knot. Furthermore, always remember that it is always the lower tag that you tie the fly to. In other words, after you've made your surgeon's knot, you've got two tags. Yeah. All right. One above and one below the knot. And the one that is above the knot, i.e. the closest to the fly line, is not the one you use to attach your fly to. Yeah. You would tie it to the one below. Um, the other thing about it is that um, the, the knot that I use to tie the flies on, of course, is the Davy knot, which is my own knot. Yeah. And I don't use any, any other. And if you use that knot and you tie it correctly, you should have absolutely no problem with fish busting you off. If okay. fish break you up, it's usually the angler activity, angler yeah, fault. That's angler right. Off, you didn't tie the knot right. That's right. <laughs> so that's the Davy. So Davy yeah. not Davy not to tie on your flies. You can use the instead of the clinch knot, just use the Davy knot. That's all I use. Yeah. Okay. And I've I've used that all my life, and I and I let me tell you, I've caught some huge fish in my life doing that big big Atlantic salmon, and this something and the other. I was going to say that in all probability. If the truth of the man had been known, 
the reason why anglers lose fish is something they've done wrong, if you know what I mean by oh, yeah. that. You know, you, you know, they set the hook too hard, they yeah. hang on too hard based on the line they're using. They didn't tie the knot effectively well. Usually, the loss or the break off of fish is, is related to the angler doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. I know it's angler, angler error for sure. I, I was just thinking, uh, I, you know, since we had our last episode, I, th- I'll put it again, I'll put a link out to that one. It was a couple of years ago. I've, I've had Dave Whitlock on. I know a good friend of yours, and it was, oh really, yeah, it was really great because I know Dave went through some stuff and he's come out of it. He talked a little bit about it on the podcast, and we had a, we had a good time. I'll, I'll, I'll link to that one as well. Um, he noted it was interesting because I think we talked about you. I think he noted one of these stories, one of your stories about how. You back in the day, I think this is when you first moved and started fishing the white. Um, but you, I guess you had a, a lady. I don't know if you're married or you're together, but you basically you wanted to move closer to the fishing, and I think that broke up the relationship. Was that is there any truth to that? Is that is that how that went down back in the day? Yeah, that yes, that's right. Because yes, as you know, Dave and I have been real great friends for a lot of years. You know, a lot of years, and I, I taught Dave wet fly fishing which he loves because he was aware of that, obviously, but as far as the, the, the practicalities of understanding of it, how we uh, do that from UK, he didn't really kind of understand that. And so I taught him that <clears throat> and he loves that style of fishing, but that's exactly right. I used to come down here and stay with Dave fishing because I, I lived in Chicago at the time. And at the time, my ex-wife had no interest whatsoever living in Arkansas and I sure as hell didn't want to carry on living in Chicago. But at the time I also, at the factory where I produced all the SLF dubbins in the UK, and so I was back and forth all the oh. time. And so I had the the, the, the mail order business I had over there as, as well. So ultimately what I did, I sold the SLF dubbing business to uh, Wapsie guys who are friends of mine here in Mount Home. And uh, yeah, I ended up moving here to Arkansas, to the White River, because, you know, though I fished all over the world, in some absolutely gorgeous places, you know, trout are trout, regardless of wherever you fish. Um, and obviously, as you well know, where we find trout, we find clean water. That's another thing, too. Yeah. Um, the yeah. White River was something extraordinary in that respect, more so because of the numbers of large brown trout that this river holds, which is, there's no other river that I know of in this country that contains as many percentage 20 inch plus brown trout that this river does if there's one downside of it to some extent i would say that it is a river somewhat dependent on a larger percentage of stock rainbow trout yeah okay that provides a resource would i prefer to fish waters that have more wild trout habitat of course i would yes absolutely but as we well know today the fishing pressure, even on waters out west, is immense compared to where it used to be. And, you know, rivers can sustain a certain amount of fishing pressure, but there comes a point where it's excessive. And what happens ultimately is that the the, the fishing deteriorates. You know, the fish get wised up, and the percentage of mortality is increased, and fly fishing creates mortality, like it or not. You know, not every fish that we catch and release survives, because they don't. I mean, it's a percentage game. So, but ultimately, yeah, that's mostly the reason why I yeah. chose to come here to the White River. That's and it. it. You've it, been there ever it, since. Absolutely, yeah. You know, it's um, it's a great river in many respects for anglers to visit and guarantee to catch fish. That, mm. that I will give you. Yeah. Um, because of the way it's managed, which is pretty good, really. The Arkansas Game yeah. Fish Commission do a pretty good job in fishery management here uh we fortunately in the last few years we've had some uh, def, definite increases in uh shall we say uh management as far as limitations of what anglers can can harvest for example you can't harvest brown trout less than 24 inches in a river oh, wow. there's now a uh, uh, you're only legally allowed to keep one fish over 14 inches of, yep. in rainbow class stuff so yeah. It's moved on a lot since when I first came here, which is no no question of a doubt being beneficial for the fishery. I noticed on your website you've got a um, you're fishing out of a drift boat. There's a photo there. Do you guys use a lot of drift boats to get get down the river? No, 
No, I used to. I don't. Uh, pretty much our regular river boats here are around 21, 22 feet long. Um, flat bottom boats, and we run outboard motors on them. Oh, okay. Uh, See because the outboard, yep. It's a big river. you got to understand, you know, there's something like 100 miles of tailwater trout fishery on yeah. this river. And uh, once again, it's subject to some serious generation levels at times. And, you, you know, the downside of a drift boat is that you're subject to whatever they do on the generation. So, you know, they may start off at low flows in the morning, then they jerk it up to higher flows. And if you're out there in a drift boat, of course, you're subject to getting caught in that. Whereas if you've got, you know, a motor, you can either run upstream and get above it or you can get down below it. So the the, the ability to move up and down the river at will is very, very important on a river system like this. And more to the point, unlike the Western rivers, uh, you shuttle services here are a little different uh, mm. out there with the business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but generally, but there are friends of mine that use drift boats, and in idyllic situations of lower flows and this on the other, yeah, absolutely, a drift boat is gotcha. a perfect thing to use or personal watercraft. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as I uh, interest, I'm I'm doing a little side series uh, on the podcast. We're covering like the history of drift boats, so I'm a little interested in what everybody's using. I've had. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, the drift boating, the boat started, a lot of it started out in Oregon and it has kind of, um, evolved a little bit oh, over, yeah, that's right. over the years and the Colorado and stuff. But no, this is, this is awesome. I just was checking on that. So, um, all right, Davey. Well, I, I think that's uh, I think that's a wrap. I, uh, just wanted to thank you for coming off. People have questions for you. I'll send them over to, uh, Davey Watton, flyfishing.com. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I get, I get a ton of stuff like that. Always questions and Perfect. my email response and i'll always get i may not get to respond to them the same day but i will get around to to answer those questions that people want to ask of me that's not not a problem okay all right david well i think we've created i i want to say this is probably the best uh, wet fly podcasting uh, episode ever I, I'll, I'll compare that but i'm going to do some summary i'll do a little show notes on this and have a good little summary for people but just want to thank you for coming on again you know you, you've uh you, this is the second time on the show. I've only had a few people that have been on twice now, so I appreciate you uh, coming back, and we'll, we'll keep in touch with you down the line. Oh, you're most welcome. Anytime, you know, and, any, you know, you got any questionnaires or whatever, just forward them on to me, and we'll take care of it. All right, Dave? All right, Dave. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, and try and get your ass down here on the White <laughs> River with me one day. I, I will. I'm, I'm coming down there. That's right. All right, Dave. We'll talk to you. See ya. Thanks a lot. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 173. I would love if you can leave a quick rating and review for the show. You can head over to uh, wetflyswing.com slash love. Love is the answer here. That'll get you. That'll help uh, easily leave a review. There's a, a bright and beautiful page there you can check out and, um, and do that quickly if you can. That'd be amazing. I want to thank you again for stopping by today. Check out the show. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. Hope maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.